All right. What's up, guys? So we're going to talk about athlete testing today. So we're going to talk all about objective testing for athletes. How do you test based on energy system, based on sport? How do you test uh, basic, basically groups of athletes versus individual athletes? Uh, and then we're going to talk about statistics and normative data. So whenever you run a test, what are you actually going to expect in terms of uh, a good score, a bad score? Does that depend on the, the test or does that depend on the athlete? We're going to get into it. Uh, so we're going to talk about vertical jump, 300-yard shuttle run, T-test, VO2 max, validity, intra-rater, inter-rater reliability, a lot of stuff. Guys, if you are on the movement system email list, so if you're on the movement system email list, you will get the notes for this. And if you guys know anything about the notes for uh, these live videos, they're like they're like gold. They're good. They're good information condensed into like a nice short page. A lot of like important things to know. So if you want that and you're not already on the email list, just comment email list and I'll add you to the email list before I send this out. So that way we can we can get you the notes. And if you ever do run into a situation where you you uh, are watching this on a replay or something like that and, and you're not able to, to find the notes anywhere, you can always just send me a message either on Instagram through DM at the movement system or through uh, the, the, the Facebook group. A, a bunch of you guys are in the Facebook group. If you're catching this and you're not already in the Facebook group, just go ahead and join the strength and conditioning study group on Facebook. All right, guys, without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into it. We're going to focus here on four main tests, four main tests. Uh, this is based on different energy systems. So we kind of have one good test that we understand, that we understand the energy system, the scoring, everything. And then we can apply that to sports. I also do have some sport examples that we'll get into once we kind of talk through the test a little bit. All right, guys, if you are live, go ahead and comment live. I just want to see who made it on here live. Uh, if you're catching this on a replay, go ahead and comment replay here. Uh, but either way, uh, glad to have you. And let's go ahead and dive into it. All right. Vertical jump. Let's just start off there. There are multiple ways to perform the vertical jump test. Probably the most common way to perform the vertical jump test is with the sticks, right? The sticks meaning uh, it's basically a pole. And then on the pole, there's a bunch of uh, inch separated by one inch, a bunch of sticks, right? And then you jump and you smack the sticks. If you're doing a vertical jump test that way, uh, it's fairly reliable, right? So there are other methods that are different. So those would be things such as jumping with a force plate, which it's actually not a force plate, it's a timing plate. It just time, it just measures the time that you're in the air. Uh, that's another way to test it. Both of those will get you pretty similar results, uh, but what are we actually testing when we are doing vertical jump? We know we're testing height, right? So either one of those, whether you reach up and then you jump, you know, 13 inches past that and you measure 13 inches that way, or whether you jump off of a timing plate, you're 0.6 seconds in the air and it calculates 13 seconds. I don't know what that conversion factor is. You don't need to know that either, but you get the idea. You just test an athlete and they have a 13 inch vertical jump. What does that actually mean? Like, what are you actually testing in terms of the physiology of the athlete? One, and then is that good or is it bad, right? Is it good for a high schooler? Is it good for a college uh, athlete? Is it good for males, females? How do we know? That's what we're going to talk about next. So first off, energy system. Really important. Whenever you're studying the tests, the objective tests, the first thing that you should think about, the very first thing to think about is what energy system is this? Or what physiological characteristic am I actually testing? Because this is important to know if you're even doing the right test. It doesn't matter about the the uh, the effect size and the Z score and all this other stuff if, if you're not even doing the right test for the athlete. So when we're doing a vertical jump test, we're testing maximal muscle power. This is one test of maximal muscle power. Other tests would be the, the Margaria Kaleman stair test, which we're not gonna really get into today, but that would be another test of power. And uh, it's, it's actually very similar. It's, it's how fast or how uh, quickly can a uh, an athlete move up the stairs, like run up a set of stairs. And you're basically assessing the, the amount that their body weight moves in the vertical direction in amount of time. So it's actually a really similar test whenever you actually think about the science behind it in comparison to the vertical jump. But either way, that's an example of a power test. So vertical jump test, 
stair test, uh, even actually a one rep max power clean in, in a little bit of a different way, right? And that, that applies to a little bit of a different athlete than a vertical jump test. But those are all maximal muscle power tests. Understanding that will then allow you to match that test with the sport. So before we really say, is this a good score or a bad score for the athlete? We have to know that, is it an appropriate test for the sport? And then, then we'll get into the normative data of the athletes. Let's think about a sport that would, you know what? We'll put it out to you guys. What sport would we do vertical, uh, vertical jump testing in? What sport? And honestly, try to pick the best one. So try to pick one of the best ones. There's actually a number of pretty good examples for this. But vertical jump testing is really specific for certain sports. And the first one that comes to mind, uh, a lot of you guys already got it. Three of you guys already got it. Basketball, right? Basketball involves a lot of vertical jumping. The sport is anaerobic. And uh, vertical jumping is so anaerobic that we call it alactic. It's, it's anaerobic in a sense that we don't use oxygen when we're – doing a vertical jump test, right? Because it, it happens so fast that we just use the ATP that's already right there in the muscle. So we don't have time to, uh, you know, utilize an oxidative energy system or even anaerobic glycolysis. We just use the ATP that's already there in the muscle. We just jump, boom, <laughs> right? And that's why it's actually, uh, when we think of the order of tests, it's one of the very first ones we would do, right? You might do flexibility before it. You might do, um, you know, body, body, skin folds for body fat but right up there with like the first one of the first tests that you would do would be vertical jump and the reason for that is again that it's a it's such a fast test it's alactic it takes almost no energy it just uses the atp that's right there it doesn't cause any fatigue and it's really specific for sports like basketball and volleyball and those are the two that i was thinking of other sports that it could apply to right like football players especially someone like a wide receiver uh, who has to jump in that, their sport, and again, the plays are short. It, it replicates the demand of the vertical jump. Um, you know, potentially other sports too, right? Like a cricket uh, sport, uh, even rugby, right? You're going to be jumping in that, but not quite as specific as a volleyball player who's going to have to jump hundreds of times throughout a match, right? Or a basketball player where you're going to have to rebound, you know, hopefully t 20 times, 30 times, right, throughout the game. Okay. Now – that we know that we understand the energy system. We understand the sport that's supplied to, I'm trying to give you guys a framework for how to learn this stuff. So this is more than just me giving you information because I can just spit values at you really fast, but you wouldn't necessarily retain that. So I want to give you guys a system for learning this. So we know the test, we know the energy system. Then we think about the sport and now we're going to think about the, the values, right? What's a good score and what's a bad score. And there's there guys, there's not like a, Okay, 15 inches is good, 20 inches is uh, – or, or 15 inches female, 20 inches male. There's nothing like that, right? You can't, you can't simplify it that much. We know there's a range of good values, which I'm about to give you. And uh, if you're taking notes and you don't yet have the notes, you, you just take notes on paper. I would encourage you. It, it helps you remember stuff. Uh, if you have the notes, you can just kind of follow along with these notes. Uh, but either way, males – 15 to 22 inches tends to be our range. Basketball players, we want to see at the top of that range. Volleyball players, we want to see at the top of that range, right? So if we're testing uh, our male volleyball players and we're seeing that they're getting scores of 14, 15, right? That's an indication that even though it's kind of in that appropriate range of a vertical jump test, they're on the low end, and their sport demands that. It demands a really high level of that. So in that case, we're gonna we're gonna want to work them up towards that 22 inches, if possible, right? And what kind of training is that gonna be? That's gonna be plyometric training, uh, power training, uh, you know, potentially even like something like a French contrast type training, where you're doing a, a heavy load followed by jumping. Uh, any of these type of training methods would cause us to improve this score. So for males, 15 to 22 inches. For females, in general, a little bit lower. We know that power is one of the variables that is actually different. When we think about age and sex-related differences, power is one of the things that actually males tend to show uh, a relative and absolute amount more power. Uh, whereas we know that, for example, strength relative to body weight, females are very similar. Just something to point out there. 
Um, and also males on average are taller, which which could potentially have an effect on uh, vertical jump too, because you know relative to height, you're jumping a little bit more. But either way, females, we're looking at 10 to 16 inches. And again, volleyball players, basketball players, we would want towards the top end of that. Uh, for example, a cross country runner, a field hockey player, someone who's, who's playing low or doing a, a different sport that's not very specific, they're fine if they're at that you know, 10, 12 inches. Uh, because again, it's not something they need for their sport. A soccer player, you see them at 8, 10 inches as a female soccer player, and that's going to cue you into like, okay, this is something that this athlete does need to work on. We need to emphasize that in programming. Okay, uh, so that's kind of our breakdown for vertical jump. Again, we're going to go through boom, 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 boom uh, test here, but hopefully that makes sense to you so far. All right. Moving on, uh, if you guys do have any questions, go ahead and drop them in the in the comments there. But moving on, we'll talk about the shuttle run next, the 300-yard shuttle run. Uh, and this is a standardized assessment, too, with good objective data. And, and here's the thing, guys. There are lots and lots of tests out there. There are lab tests and there are field tests. Field tests, meaning something that you can do as a strength coach with minimal equipment. So... A vertical jump test is considered a field test. You you might need the sticks, but you can even do it with like holding chalk and like marking on a wall or something like that. So it's considered a low a low equipment requirement, a field test. A, a lab test would be something like VO2 max, which we're going to talk about in a second. But again, it requires more equipment and it requires a, a lab setting. Okay. And again, there's a bunch of these tests and some of them have really good research behind them meaning that there have been studies done to show the validity and the reliability and the applicability to sport, meaning that if an athlete, uh, and, and while we're on the vertical jump, let's just use this as an example, if an athlete improves from the day one of preseason training to the end of preseason training, so say they have eight weeks of preseason training, and they improve their vertical jump by four inches, we know that that has carryover to their sport that volleyball players are going to get more blocks, that basketball players are going to catch more rebounds, right? That's high. And we're going to talk about the uh, – if you stick around to the end, we're going to talk about validity and reliability and, and define those more in detail. But just think about that. Uh, all, all, different, all these different tests, um, the more research you have on them, the more that we can demonstrate and actually show that there's carryover between the test and performance. All right. If you guys are on here, make sure you hit the like button. It helps other people find the video. Boom. All right. 300 yard shuttles next. What energy system are we talking about here? If you have never seen a 300 yard shuttle and you have no idea what I'm talking about, uh, you just heard the word 300 yard shuttle for the very first time. It's okay. Break it down in your head just right now and think 300 yards. I You probably have seen a football field, an American football field or even a soccer field, right? Like a other country football, I don't know, whatever. Football field, 100, 120 yards. So you know that, okay, you can think about three football fields in length. That's a pretty far distance, right? Uh, if you were just to run straight for 300 yards, most athletes, that's going to take 40 to 50 seconds, right? Okay. So that just gives you an idea of what we're talking about here. So even if you're not at all familiar with the 300-yard shuttle run, it's a test. It's 300 yards. So it's probably going to take at least that 40 to 50 seconds. The nature of shuttle runs is that you have to turn and move back and forth. So it's probably going to take more than 45 seconds, right? Because again, we're, we, we have to turn and change directions a, a bunch of times. So that should cue you into this, the fact that this is an energy system. It's going to be involved in efforts that are around a minute, right? Uh, plus or minus 10, 20 seconds, right? But we're thinking, when we're thinking again of tests and then we're thinking of energy system. In general, this is going to be an effort that's about a minute long. What sports use minute-long efforts? And this is where you really have to get in the head of the player, right? The, the actual athlete here. The athlete in, say, a baseball game, is are they going to be going through a one-minute effort? Probably not. And the only time in baseball is if you get caught in a rundown. Um, say you get a triple and you get caught in a rundown between second and third. Maybe that play is going to last like 30 seconds, but that's pretty unheard of. Most plays in baseball are like five, 10 seconds, right? So we consider baseball to be an ATP PC system type sport. 
other sports, which you guys are already commenting, track and field, 400 meters, basketball, soccer. Those are all examples of sports where plays can last for a minute, right? Especially something like basketball. You think they're going to be running a play down. You're getting into position. Uh, there's a steal. You have to run to the other side of the court. There's a quick basket. You have to run back. A play can last easily about a minute. Hockey is another example. You get on the you get on the ice and you're moving, right? You're going to be back and forth chasing that puck for at least a minute, maybe two, three minutes, right? A tennis, you can you can definitely get a play that lasts a minute long. That's you know maybe maybe on average plays are a little bit shorter, but you're within that range. They're an anaerobic type athlete, is what I'm getting at here. So when we think about all these different athletes and we think about the energy systems involved. Uh, the, the ones that we mentioned, track and field, tennis, soccer, basketball, lacrosse, where those plays are about a minute, this, this test, a 300-yard shuttle, is going to be applicable for those athletes, right? Because we pair the energy system with the uh, sport, right? The, the energy system of the test with the energy system of the sport. That's important. So knowing that, then we can actually look at data, right? Like normative data and see if this test is, is uh, if they're running, getting a good score, a bad score kind of thing. Okay. So now that we know that we can move on to good and bad score. Uh, one thing I didn't want to mention before I forgot, when do you test these preseason, uh, off season, in season? And there's no direct, like easy answer for this, right? Um, a lot of times within a, a macro cycle, and I'll just draw like a, an idea here. Uh, but let's just say, you are a strength coach and let's just say you guys, uh, Joe, let's just say Joe here. He passes his CSCS exam. He gets hired by the local high school and the local high school has an athletic director. And they say, Joe, I want to see your plan for your basketball team because he, they said, okay, Joe, you're new to the, the program. You're getting your basketball team. I want to see what you're testing what your plan is for, for training, off-season, preseason, whatever. They, let's just say they give Joe a bunch of freedom with this. And Joe decides to go and sit down and make a little bit of a plan. He would probably write a macro cycle. You wouldn't necessarily show the athletic director, okay, I'm doing three sets of eight of this, you know, two sets of ten of that. The athletic director doesn't care. They just want to make sure that the overall is organized. So you might draw a kind of a, a macro cycle here that looks like that. In season, preseason, off, post season. So he might draw a macro cycle that looks like this is super basic, guys. Post season, off season, preseason, in season. And maybe for his athletes, he puts the months up here, right? Like the months of the training. But then the Joe might decide because he wants to show off to this athletic director and show his knowledge, he'll put, you know, testing blocks at different points. So within his macro cycle, he'll write test, preseason, test, off season, test, in season, right? And let's just say, for example, he wants to do the 300 yard shuttle. Joe knows, Joe's smart, right? Joe, I hope you're appreciating this and still on here. Whatever, Joe's smart. He knows that he's gonna be doing conditioning with his basketball players. He's gonna be doing uh, suicides, right? Running back and forth on the court. He's gonna do a mile run uh, once a week or a couple mile run outside, whatever. He's going to be doing some, some conditioning, some interval training, some whatever off season, whenever he has his uh, basketball players, let's just say uh, September, October for whatever it, it, this, it doesn't matter. September, October, he's going to be doing conditioning. So he's going to decide at the very start, the very first day that he gets those athletes for conditioning, he's going to say, okay, we're going to run the 300 yard shuttle today. And then I'm going to plan another 300-yard shuttle run in two months. Then because, again, this block of training that he, he put it at the start and the end of, because that training block was focused on conditioning, Joe's going to be able to show his athletic director that uh, on average his team got, uh, let's just say he's working with female basketball players. They scored on average 78 seconds while they were deconditioned before they went through Joe's conditioning uh, training for his team. And then he could show that on average, his athletes scored, let's just say 70 seconds at the end of conditioning. So Joe could, could lay out this plan for his athletic director and say, I'm going to test them uh, on 
300 yard shuttle at the beginning and the end of their off season training, because that's when they're going to be doing conditioning. So we're going to do it at the beginning of off season at the end of off season. And then Joe could show that his team got eight seconds better on the 300 yard shuttle run, which is going to help them, you know, play four quarters uh, better perform better. Right. Joe said, hell yeah, dude. I've, nice. All right, cool. And now let's just say that in this testing block, because we're going to preseason, Joe decides he's going to do vertical jump testing. And he can show that his his females, if we remember the scores, let's just say they're on the low end. They're at 10, 10 inches on average. And in real life, you know, I'm, I'm sure this is not as clean and cut here, but this gives you guys the idea, right, of, of the, the job that you're going to do as a strength coach potentially um, and, and kind of how objective testing works, how to apply it. Okay. So let's just say he's doing, he does his, his, uh, uh, vertical jump testing at the beginning and the end of preseason because Joe is smart. He's saying, okay, my preseason is going to be focused on more sports specific work. I'm going to be doing plyometrics. I'm going to be doing uh, dynamic effort lifts. I'm going to be doing power work with my basketball players. So Joe says to his female basketball players, we're going to do all, all you guys are going to do the vertical jump test at the start of preseason and at the end of preseason. And let's just say Joe is a smart guy. He, he built some really great plyometric programs, did really good quality preseason training. And then boom, he took his athletes from 10 inches to 14 inches. So now not only did his athletes do well at the conditioning phase of his training, but they also succeeded in the power block of his training. So, in this case, Joe's going to get a raise. Uh, he's going to stay on as a strength coach for the next season. And uh, his, his athletic director is going to say, okay, we want you to also take this other team because you're doing so, such a great job, right? And this is really why you need to understand objective testing uh, that is like based on energy system, good and bad scores, and how to apply it to your athletes. All right. He went from average Joes to pros. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Nice, guys. If this has been helpful, uh, I hope it has been so far. We're, we're about two tests in. We still have a lot to cover. This is going to be a little bit longer, but that's all right. Guys, this is going to be – we're going to cover four tests total. Uh, that's probably not even a third of the, the total number of tests that you need to know. And I know you guys are probably thinking, man, I wish this webinar would – or this, uh, this live would just go on for like a couple hours and I could learn all of this stuff about testing administration. Well, you're in luck because I'm going to do a webinar this Sunday – and that's going to be all about testing. So whatever we don't get to today, we're going to cover the rest of the tests uh, and dive deep into it for two hours on Sunday in a webinar. If you're interested in that, uh, I'm going to send it. There's going to be a sign-up link at the end of the notes, which you're going to get in the email, or I'm just going to post it to the Facebook group and I'll post it to the uh, YouTube live as well. So if you're interested and you want to learn even more after the end of this, then just go ahead and sign up for that webinar and we'll, we'll dive deep and keep going. All right, we've covered the vertical jump and the 300-yard shuttle run. Now, we're going to go to the T-test. <laughs> Nancy's like, good work, Joe. <laughs> try, I try. I love this. All right, we're going to go to the T-test. Who is the T-test for? Well, before we say that, we're going to use our framework, right? So T-test, what's the energy system or the physiological characteristics? So if you're not familiar, I actually did a YouTube video on the T-test. It's exactly what it sounds like. You're going to run in a T. So you're going to run. It's going to be sprinting, shuffling, 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 and then backpedal. Uh, so sprint, shuffle, shuffle, and backpedal. And um, in this case, the big points for this, you can watch the YouTube video for the details. And, and I actually did it with an NFL athlete, which is kind of cool. Um, Anyone want to guess his time? I didn't put it in the video, uh, but I just timed it whenever I was watching the YouTube video yesterday to prepare for this live. This guy's a Denver Bronco, uh, defensive end. Uh, I had him out while we were training to the turf and just set up a T-test and, and did a quick video for YouTube for you guys. What was his time? And, and this will give you guys a good idea. Hopefully, if you're like, oh, if I can remember this, this guy's time, uh, then you'll remember the range is better. But his time since no one's guessing, but it was, a, it was 10.97 seconds. He's a bigger guy. 10.97 seconds, 10.97. And we'll show you how that fits into the ranges here in a second, but that's to sprint forward 10 yards. Uh, I want to say it's five yard shuffle uh, left, five yard shuffle, right? Just watch the video to get the details. And then 
back to the center and then backpedal 10 yards. So 10.97 seconds was his time. Uh, is this actually a good um, test for him? And actually, yeah, as a defensive end, really good test, right? Because defensive ends need to be able to run forward, backpedal, do lateral movements, and a lot of the plays are going to last about 10 seconds, right? So this is a really specific test for a football player. Uh, this is also a good test for what other sports, right? So what other sports are going to have plays that are lasting roughly 10 seconds that are going to involve the, the movement patterns, right? The sprinting, the backpedaling, the lateral shuffling. What types of other sports would this be applicable for? Give you guys a second. Whether you're live or on the replay, I know – uh, honestly, I, I looked at the statistics sometime, like three quarters of you guys watch it on the replay. Totally fine, because I know the, the time doesn't work out in different time zones and people are working and whatnot. But whether you're live or on the replay, be interactive. Try to learn with this as much as you can. Okay, soccer, rugby, uh, field hockey, lacrosse. Um, what are some other ones? Uh, Sports like that, though, guys, that are going to involve movement in different directions. Basketball is a really good example, actually, <clears throat> because, again, confined space, right? Uh, basketball is probably a better example, actually, than soccer, because, again, soccer is a huge field. A lot of the plays are longer and more like sweeping type changes. Basketball, it's a lot of cutting, twisting, running, like setting a pick, right, and moving close around players. You don't have to necessarily get this detailed about it, but – you know, just understanding the physiology of the test and the physiology of the sport and the movement patterns involved in the sport, the energy systems involved in the sport can kind of clue us into who this test is going to be best for. Handball is a pretty good example. Uh, Frisbee, yeah. I mean, Frisbee is a bigger field, but yeah, a, a lot of those movements, again, you're trying to lose a player, you're trying to make a play, um, you're, you're quickly start starting and stopping, multi-directional, all good. Okay, so T-test, we know the energy system. Uh, well, this one, we wouldn't, we wouldn't necessarily characterize it by energy system. It, it, it is an anaerobic test, but the, the T test doesn't test your anaerobic capacity, right? Really the only anaerobic capacity test is, is the 300 yard shuttle. The, the, the only like really good valid one, at least uh, T test, although it lasts 10 seconds, the main thing it's testing is your change of direction, right? Because you're changing direction one, two, three, at least four times. Uh, as you're going, or as you're going from forward to side to side to side to backpedaling, right? So it's really a change of direction test. We broadly classify it as agility, but we know in reality, agility in, in, in real life means reacting to a stimulus, reacting, excuse me, to a cone or, or reacting like a coach's cue or a point or a whistle or a ball. So in, in real life, agility means reacting to a stimulus, but we generally classify this as like change of direction slash agility. And again, it's, it's testing the ability of the player to, to start, stop, move in different planes, that kind of thing. Okay. What's a good score for males about 10 seconds, about 10 seconds is a competitive score. You might see 9.7, 9.8 uh, for bigger players that uh, aren't necessarily going to be moving as quickly, right? Like if you think about a, um, you know, a, wide receiver that's 190 pounds they're probably going to move a little bit quicker than our our defensive end who's you know 275 295 changing direction so you might expect like you know dre for example was at 10.97 pretty reasonable time for a huge defensive end um, but anywhere like that 10 to 11 second range uh females generally 10 to 12 seconds for this one is what you see there uh, again, for a sport like basketball, volleyball, where you're going to need those quick change of directions, you want to be close to that 10 seconds. Um, for a sport that's not as specific for, you might be okay around that 12 seconds. All right, moving on, because we're, we're kind of rolling here into 30 minutes. Uh, VO2 max. This is a lab test, not a field test. So remember, we talked about field tests being minimal equipment. Lab test being more equipment, more stuff's required. You can't do it on the field. Uh, so VO2 max test is typically done on a treadmill, sometimes a bike with a, a mask, not like a you know face shield mask, but like a breathing tube that is measuring your oxygen consumption and your carbon dioxide that you're exhaling. And that would uh, allow you to measure the amount of volume of oxygen that you're consuming. And it's much more accurate than watches. Watches are just an estimate based on... Uh, basically just like uh, data that they have 
that says like because of other people's objective tests that tended to to show that at this heart rate and this age, it, it's the watch isn't actually measuring your VO2 max. It's just estimating it based on their in, information. But anyway, if you're actually doing a good real VO2 max test on a treadmill, uh, that's how you get a good inf good uh, number for this. I did a YouTube video on this as well. You could see what my VO2 max was uh, as like an amateur triathlete a couple of years ago. Um, if you're interested, go ahead and check it out. The movement system VO2 max. But what's a good score? We're going to do two things. We're going to do the 50th percentile as a college age male and college age female. So for college age male, 50th percentile is 44 and that's milliliters per kilogram body weight per day. Uh, college female, 50th percentile is 38. So again, don't super worry about the units. It's, it's almost always relative to body weight. That's the one that most people are using is that milliliters per kilogram body weight per day. But we know females around 38, males around 44. For our athletes, though, they probably need to be a little bit higher. So what's considered the high range for uh, male athletes is around 55. Uh, and we're going to break it down by energy system here in a second. I actually forgot to use my framework. But males, a good high score is around 55. Uh, for females, around 50. What sports would actually require you to be at that high level? What do you think, guys? Probably sports that are going to have some big aerobic component. So soccer, uh, cross country, triathlon, cyclists, uh, any sport that's going to be those longer duration efforts. Longer duration effort sports uh, are going to require you to be in that for males around 55, for females around 50. Right. So you could you could get away with less than that. Say it's a female and, uh, you know, a tennis player. If they're at 45, 46, you're actually probably okay because they're actually significantly above the average and they're almost to that high range. So maybe it's something they could improve, but it's not super uh, important. It's not like something that stands out as like being really low, if that makes sense. Okay. Uh, energy system wise, though, we talked about aerobic capacity. So this is an aerobic capacity lab test. An, an example of an aerobic capacity field test would be a 1.5 mile run or a 12 minute run, right? Um, and and that's, there's no breathing measurements involved, it's just distance. And, uh, you know, in that case, you can get a uh, an idea of where they stand normative data wise with those numbers. But for right now, we'll just talk about these. All right, let's dive into athlete examples. I wanna make sure we get to everything here, or as, at least as much as we can. Athlete examples. I'm just gonna read it to you. If you have the notes, you can follow along. Jerry is an 18-year-old, 180-pound male basketball player with a vertical jump of 20 inches, a one-rep max bench press of 195 pounds, 300-yard shuttle run of 76 seconds. What area of his strength and conditioning program should be emphasized? So, again, he's a 180-pound male basketball player. So we're thinking like senior in high school or uh, freshman in college, basketball player, male, 180 pounds, uh, Vertical jump, 20 inches. One rep max bench press, 195. 300 yard shuttle run, 76 inches. If you ask Jerry, he needs to probably he probably thinks he needs to improve his bench press because he's a college freshman, male, and that's his priority. But what is your priority as a strength and conditioning professional thinking about the energy demands of his sport and the uh, data around those numbers that we just gave you? And... Uh, at least my conclusion here was that that 76 second time was the lowest. That was what stood out to me here. And I, I designed the question. I wrote it last night. So uh, that's that's what I wrote it to be low. So we know that when we look back at the 300 yard shuttle times for males, we were looking at 56 to 74 seconds. Basketball is an anaerobic sport. So we want him to be on that lower end around 60 seconds. And he's right now at 76 seconds. So that tells us that we need to emphasize anaerobic capacity in his training, right? Interval training, stuff like that. It's going to improve his anaerobic capacity. All right. Boom. One down already. Next one. Sushmita is a 22-year-old, 130-pound female tennis player. And most of these I, I just knew, uh, like, people and, and just used their names. Uh, but anyway, Sushmita is a 22 22-year-old, 130-pound female tennis player. Her 5'10", 5 5'10", 5 time is 
nine or 4.9 seconds. Her body composition is 25% body fat and her VO2 max test is 46. What should area should be emphasized in her strength and conditioning program? So 130 pound female tennis player, 22 years old, 5105 is the pro agility test, which we didn't get into the data of that today. Um, but that's 4.9 seconds. Her body composition is 25% body fat and VO2 max of 46. What do you guys think? And I'll just give you guys the answer here because we're we're running uh, short on time here. Probably going to go another five minutes. But uh, in this case, none of the above. So for tennis, it's an anaerobic sport, right? A lot of the efforts are shorter. Aerobic conditioning is a factor, but she doesn't have to have a super high aerobic uh, level. So 46, maybe it's a little bit on the lower end, but it doesn't stand out as like a huge uh, thing that she needs to work on. 25% body fat is actually a healthy range for a you know female 22 year old. 25% body fat's fine as long as she has the lean muscle she needs. She can perform uh, the sport. Like 25% body fat is not like a high body body fat percentage. If you're used to like the little uh, like grippy or like the scale measurements with the BIA bioelectric impedance analyst, those tend to underestimate. So people think they have a lower body fat, but if you actually do a DEXA scan or a bod pod or underwater weighing or something like that, uh, you'll probably see a lot of people that are at, that are really good athletes at a high level at 25% body fat, perfectly fine, especially females. So that doesn't stand out as something that she definitely needs to decrease. Uh, and then 4.9 seconds for 5105. Again, you could look into the normative data for that. Or if you're coming to the webinar on Sunday, we'll talk about it then. But that's also actually a, a pretty reasonable time for her. So nothing stands out as a huge factor um, in, in Shushimita's case. All right, one more. Sarah is a 23 year old, 118 pound female pole vaulter. Her 40 meter run time is 5.1 seconds, T test 12.5 seconds, and she can compete complete a maximum of 18 push ups. So, Pole vaulter can do 18 pushups is her max T test of 12.5 and 40 meter run time of 5.1. So a lot of people will look at this and say, okay, 40 meter runs really important for pole vault. That's probably what we need to work on. Actually 5.1 is pretty good. Like that's fine. She does not need to improve that. That's, that's pretty, pretty good time already. Uh, and another thing is 40 meters is a little bit farther than 40 yards. So if you're used to looking at 40 yard dash times, it's just a little bit less. But anyway, 5.1 is fine for a 40-meter run time. T-test, actually, 12.5 seconds. If we think back to what we wanted, we wanted our, our uh, females at 10 to 12 seconds, so she's kind of above that range. We would like to see her agility a little bit better. And, uh, you know, not super, super specific to the sport, right, because she's not going to change direction. She's going one direction, right up and over the pole. But – it's, it's pretty lacking in terms of the time there. It's something that the, uh, this athlete can improve. Push-ups are actually okay. 18 push-ups for a 23-year-old uh, female. Um, that I, I just looked at the data there, and that's kind of right within a, a standard range. It's not great, but it's not uh, bad, right? The T-test, the 12.5 seconds, is actually below the range. That's why... Uh, we're going to pick that T-test. And, and guys, these aren't super obvious. Like you really have to know the, the, the uh, know your ranges, know your numbers, and think about the energy system of the sport to be able to answer these. I made these kind of kind of challenging on purpose. And again, if you're on the email list, you'll get these and you'll be able to review these. So you could, you could check your answer or you could check back to these. Uh, I would actually encourage you to make more questions like this and, and keep practicing yourself. All right, real quick, we're going to go over statistics. Um, the big things here are validity. There's four types of validity that we're going to talk about and then reliability. So this one can put you to sleep. It's a snoozer a little bit, but it's important to know. Uh, you need to know this stuff. So wake up. Validity. This is, is the test measuring what it's supposed to measure? That's what validity means. Uh, accuracy is like, is the test actually like accurate? But validity is like, is it even testing what we're supposed to be testing? There's different types of validity, right? So um, we're going to talk about the four different types here. Let's just go. Let's just go right into it. 
face validity is how good the test looks to the athlete or uh, to like an athletic director or a coach, right? Like how does the test look? Does the test, does the athlete think it's a good test? That's all face validity means. It's, it's literally just like the, the face. Does it look good? Com content validity we're going to go to next. Content validity is how well the experts believe the test covers the subtopics and component validity. Uh, let's see if we can think of an example for this. So how well the experts, uh, is this the one that I had an example for? Uh, we'll get to the example here in a second. But um, for example, researchers are the ones who kind of analyze these tests for, is it testing what it's supposed to do? Is it a good test for the sport based on energy systems? So actually as a strength conditioning professional, as a CSCS, we could be the expert in determining if a T test is applicable for basketball versus soccer versus cross country, right? And we can, as an expert, say that the content validity of a T test for cross country is poor. That's poor content validity because again, it doesn't match up with the uh, subtopics and components abilities of the sport, right? Uh, and, and maybe that's not the exact perfect example, but we understand that if experts aren't uh, sure that it's basically covering what it needs to in terms of subtopics and components, then it's not going to be a, a valid test in terms of content valid validity. Okay. Next being construct validity, how well the test measures what it should measure. So this means that if, uh, let's just say a 1.5 mile run, a 1.5 mile run is an aerobic test, an aerobic capacity test. So if, uh, if we do this test, and we can show that this athlete's good, this athlete's bad, it should correspond uh, with the actual measure of aerobic capacity. So it should correspond with, actually with VO2 max, for example, right? And with aerobic performance, for example, cross-country runner's sport. Uh, and, and if it does, which in, in the case of a 1.5 mile run, it's been shown to have good construct validity. It's a, it's a well-constructed test to show that attribute. So that's construct validity. All right. And then the last one is concurrent validity. And that's how well the test corresponds with the gold standard test. And the best example for this is body composition testing. So, uh, you know, as an exercise science student in undergrad uh, four years ago now, I did uh, body composition testing on a bunch of athletes and uh, oh, actually just undergrad students. Like anyone could sign up for these body composition tests, but we would do skin folds with them. So we would do the different sites measure their skin folds, put them into the equation. We would do a bod pod where they would sit in a bod pod and we just had to hit a button. They would spit out their, their body fat percentage. And then underwater weighing where they would go underwater, blow out all their air. There would be a scale underwater that they're basically just sitting on for a few seconds. And we would get their underwater weight and, and that would estimate their body composition. All three of those tests, for example, give you an idea that this athlete has 20 20% body fat, right? But when we, when we would do those all three with one person, one would say 22%, one would say 26%, one would say 18%, right? They're not all that good. But what we know is that uh, the, for example, the bod pod has much better concurrent validity than the skin folds, meaning that the bod pod more closely, uh, respond or, or correlates with the the gold standard actually in body composition testing is really the dexa scan dexa dual energy x-ray absorptometry not super important to know but we just know that the bod pod and the dexa they they tend to show like an, if an athlete's at 18 percent on the bod pod they're probably within two percent of that on the dexa scan skin folds they might be eight percent off right so we know that the concurrent validity of the bod pod is better than the concurrent validity of skin folds. And that's why. All right, um, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, just go through inter-rater reliability here real quick. Uh, inter-rater reliability is the lack of consistent scoring by a given tester. So intra within one, intra-rater. So within, if I go and test uh, a group of athletes on, my ver on vertical jumps, and I can't keep getting consistent scoring because I'm holding the pole at that different angle. And I'm, uh, you know, whatever, I'm not instructing them the same way. And I'm giving some people a bunch of extra trials, but then other people I'm rushing. If I'm doing the test poorly like that, and they're getting inconsistent scores, that would be poor intra rater reliability. 
if I'm doing a test consistently myself, but you know, I have my assistant Aaron and I have my other assistant uh, Jeff over there running the test and they're, they're screwing around and they're not doing very well. And their measurements aren't lining up with mine. That would be inter rater reliability. So that would be if in, in the case that they're all different, poor inter rater reliability. Guys, I hope you learned a ton. I made this as super beneficial as possible, uh, jam-packed full of information, but we probably still didn't cover everything. I, I know that there's at least four more tests that I want to dive into, and uh, that's why I did the decided to do the webinar. The webinar is a two-hour, in-depth, deep dive on everything that we didn't cover now, so that way you can get more on normative data, more on energy systems, more on... Uh, statistics and reliability and validity and, and even the other terms, Z scores and, and uh, stuff like that, that we didn't get to today. If you want to learn about that, go ahead and click the link in the description, or I'm going to be posting it to the Facebook group as well to the, to sign up for the webinar this Sunday, the October 25th, 12 to 2 PM. Uh, there will be a replay available. If you can't make it live, totally understand that. I know the time zones are tough. Uh, but guys, I hope this has been really helpful for you. If you know anything about like the way that I prep for these, I put a ton of time into it. If this is what you got in the free webinar, you're going to learn a ton. Or if this is what you got in the free live, you're going to learn an absolute ton in the webinar um, and get a, a quiz along with it. The, the replay is available as well. Um, so that webinar is a good option if you want to learn just about the testing administration. If you want to learn all about the CFCS material, like top to bottom, like become a, a master of this material, then just sign up for the strength and conditioning study course. I know a bunch of you guys probably already signed up and I appreciate everyone who has. The strength and conditioning study course goes topic by topic and I walk you through all the information in a, a format like this where I can actually explain it and give you uh, context to the information that you're reading so that way you can stick it and not just pass the exam, but also go on to be a, a, a good strength coach and excel in your career. So that's really the goal, guys. I hope you've had a fun in this last 45 minutes. I've had fun teaching you guys and I always do. I appreciate you guys so much for showing up. And if you guys are interested in signing up for the webinar to learn just about the testing and administration stuff, then go ahead and click the link in the description below to sign that up, sign up for that. And if you're like, I'm sold, this is awesome. I love this format. I learn like visually and you're learning well from this type of thing. And you want notes to go along with each thing and me to explain it in depth, then go ahead and sign up for the strength conditioning study course. All right, guys, it's been real. Uh, thanks again for tuning in and I'll catch you guys soon. Thanks.